Today we have Mary Cummings, who is a writer and a historian and is the manager of the Research Center here at the Southampton History Museum. Um, if any of you have been to the past, I believe, two talks, um, you're familiar with Mary and everything that she's been doing. Um, we're going to be talking about Louisa Robb Livingston, another woman highlighted in our high style of a Gilded Age exhibit at the Southampton History Museum, which unfortunately has been closed for a while, so people haven't had a chance to see it. But thankfully, Mary has been taking the time to highlight these different important women to everybody live here via Zoom. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Mary Cummings and enjoy everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining me for this live online talk uh, co-sponsored by the Southampton History Museum and the Rogers Memorial Library. Uh, my subject today is uh, Louisa Robb Livingston in this third in the series, uh, all inspired by the current, if currently inaccessible, exhibit at the museum. Uh, High Style and the Gilded Age, uh, Southampton, 1870 to 1930. In light of her later reputation as a fierce defender of old guard ways and as a sharp critic of anyone not measuring up to her standards, it's hard to believe that Louisa Robb Livingston was ever a child. But she was, and what a childhood she must have had. In 1885, Louisa's father, J. Hamden Robb, a Harvard-educated banker and cotton merchant with a distinguished career in public service, hired the architectural firm McKim, Mead and White to design the summer cottage known as the Dolphins on the west shore of Lake Agawam. Among the earliest of the lakeside cottages, it sets a high standard for what will soon be acknowledged as the most desirable neighborhood for summering in Southampton. Louisa's mother, Cornelia Van Rensselaer Thayer Robb, a woman with an unrivaled pedigree, adds luster to the family's rank and Louisa's aristocratic self-assurance is bred in the bone. From the time she's around eight years old, Louisa is spending magical summers at the Dolphins, where the final decades of the 19th century see Lake Agawam develop into a lively center of activity. Looking back later, one of Louise's contemporaries described bicycle paths running parallel to walking paths around the lake. She recalled that in the morning, the lake was, quote, a busy and gay sight as people rode or sailed down to the beach for a swim, unquote. And she remembered that at night, with lanterns lighting the way, small boats took people back and forth visiting neighbors. On the 4th of July, a thrilling regatta was an annual event that brought out the whole village. I think I want to go back to it. Oh no, I want this. In New York City, where the family resides when they're not in Southampton, Louisa's father is appointed to the prestigious post of Parks Commissioner in 1888 and he hires McKim, Mead, and White to design a residence for the family at 23 Park Avenue. Louise is 14 when they move into the splendid Renaissance-inspired mansion, for which Stanford White is credited as the lead architect. With its five stories filled with rare art and antiques, it gets high praise in the press. One prominent architectural critic calls it, quote, the most dignified structure in all the quarter of town. Not a palace, but a fit dwelling house for a first-rate citizen. And he might have added, for his very privileged offspring. In New York, Louisa must put aside the rustic pleasures of Southampton 
for a more formal introduction to life in the highest circles of New York City society with all the privileges and responsibilities that entails. Barely past adolescence, she already stands out among her peers as a very strong personality. And with her impressive lineage and irrepressible spirit, she's expected to marry well, which she does. On April 8, 1896, the altar at St. George's Church on Stuyvesant Square is hedged with jonquils and flanked by tall palms at Louise's wedding to the rising young architect, Goodhue Livingston. It's a social merger of the highest order, linking two families descended from the old Dutch and colonial aristocracy. Louisa, in white satin and lace studded with diamonds, approaches the altar on the arm of her father, preceded by six ushers and eight bridesmaids representing Gotham's gilded youth. The ceremonies performed at noon by the Reverend Dr. William S. Rainford, the handsome, charismatic preacher hired by J.P. Morgan to lead his church, St. George's, as the rector. As Morgan's close confidant, Rainsford has enormous prestige and enjoys the Titans' friendship and support. Their close bond ends only after some 30 years when the rector's scandalous affair with a parishioner is revealed. Until then, Rainsford, a social activist on behalf of the poor, uses his pulpit to attack what he calls the tyranny of the wealthy in his city. Meanwhile, he indulges his Gilded Age taste in his personal life, orbiting the same social circles as the bride and groom and spending summers in his Southampton cottage. Uh-oh. I'm having a little trouble making it. Mary, just um, try clicking on the screen with your mouse. Uh, on the screen? Uh, yeah, what? there you go. And now you could probably use the uh, Okay. Yes, good. Louisa and Gucci were immediately embraced by New York City Society after setting up housekeeping at 38 East 65th Street. The architectural firm Goodhue had formed with partner William Trowbridge in 1894 attracts a well-heeled clientele from the Upper East Side and Wall Street and soon earns an enviable reputation for its commercial, public, and institutional buildings, many in the Beaux-Arts style. Louisa mixes easily with Goodhue's many highly placed clients who enjoy the Livingston's hospitality on 65th Street. At the same time, she's involved in a daunting array of civic and political activities herself, sought after to join clean city campaigns, hospital boards, charity organizations, and eventually Republican politics. Meanwhile, Trowbridge and Livingston is coming of age as a firm at the same time that New York City is acquiring its great luxury hotels, which are replacing the modest inns and boarding houses of the past. Building giant luxury hotels becomes a competitive sport for some of the city's wealthiest men. And when Trowbridge and Livingston wins a competition to design John Jacob Astor IV, Pleasure Palace for the People, which will command the southeast corner of Fifth Avenue and 55th Street, the firm is poised to make its most glamorous contribution to the city's changing streetscape. Opened in 1904, the St. Regis Hotel is breathtakingly hailed in the press 
not just for its architectural and technological brilliance, but for what one columnist character characterized as its role in shaping, quote, the face and style of New York. These are good years for the Livingstons, now a family of four. In the coming years, the firm's very visible landmarks for which Goodhue will receive much of the credit will include, among others, the B. Altman Building, the Equitable Trust Building, the Bank of America Building, and towards the end of his career, the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. There will also be commissions from beyond New York's borders offering many opportunities for the Livingstons to hobnob with a national and international elite. A photographer spies them in 1890 with Mrs. Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt at a coaching club event. The Vanderbilts were later divorced following a scandal involving Alfred's alleged misbehavior with another woman aboard his private railroad car, Wayfarer. But in 1890, Elsie Vanderbilt is still happy to support Alfred, who is known as the handsome Vanderbilt, in his devotion to horses and the revival of the sport of coaching. Coaching clubs are all the rage among the late 19th century elite. It's a sport that doesn't require a high degree of athleticism, but does demand great skill. Spectators dressed to the nines attend events at which impeccably outfitted coaching enthusiasts sit atop their perfectly painted and polished four-in-hand coaches and with ramrod posture an immense cool manage to control the movements of the stunning team of horses out front. There are marathons, promenades, and feats of speed and daring do. Southampton has its own devotee, it, many of them, in fact, including Henry Coe, whose scrapbooks at the museum are testimony to his high international stature in the world of coaching. Southampton's resident bohemian, Zella de Milo, never one to cede ground to the men, is also known to drive a four in hand and to careen through the village at a hair raising clip scattering pedestrians and inspiring this bit of verse. When Miss Zella Milo drives her tally-ho, she takes her whip and hits him a clip and makes the horses go. There was never any real doubt that Louisa and Goodhue would spend their summers in Southampton. They have many options for summer accommodations in the village and Louisa becomes a force in the south, summer colony of Southampton, of which she has been a part since childhood. Whoops, not much of a club woman. She does not look upon summer as a time to spend leisurely days with friends at one of the elite clubs that have sprouted in the now well-established resort. Instead, in 1901, she takes it upon herself along with a small group of women to found the fresh air home for crippled children. It is their mission to share the benefits of sun and sea with city bound, physically challenged children. The first year they rent a small buildings to, building to accommodate 10 residents. The second year they rent a more suitable res residence and they make plans for a permanent facility which will soon follow. There it is. That is the uh, building which still stands. In 1912, now at the height of his career, Goodhue Livingston purchases 10 acres adjacent to Louisa's childhood home, the Dolphins, and designs a magnificent Georgian revival mansion for the family. 
sited on the eastern part of the property, which runs from First Neck Lane to Lake Agawam. The handsome so-called cottage also commands a view of the ocean. There are stables, service buildings, and gardens on beautifully landscaped grounds that include many old trees, inspiring the mansion's name, Old Trees. Gardeners, maids, a butler, and uncounted minions are required to maintain the estate where Louisa and Goodhue entertain the cream of international society, often mixing them with prominent local guests. At this point, Louisa is well on her way to achieving the kind of social power in Southampton, epitomized by the Mrs. Astor who ruled over New York City society in the Gilded Age. The Southampton summer colony had always had its arbiters of old guard etiquette and exclusion. They were, as writer John Corey described them, a self-appointed squadron of, quote, elderly ladies of elegant breeding who were collectively known as the dreadnoughts. A less charitable view is found in a memoir left by Marietta Andrews, a student at the Shinnecock Hill Summer School of Art, who recalled tedious afternoon teas at which the dreadnoughts, who called themselves patrons, presided. They were deadly affairs, she recalled, at which the women, overfed and badly dressed in bustling silks, received the young artists. She might have been describing Sarah Redwood Parish, the dominant influence on the life of her son, Southampton's benefactor, Samuel Longstreet Parish, and herself a social force to reckon with. Parish's mother had entered the social stream in Southampton after moving into the McKinney and White House, which that a firm designed for her on First Neck Lane in 1889. Samuel lived with her for a time and put his charm at his, her disposal when she entertained at tea time and did not find a woman to equal her in his eyes until more than three decades after her death when he married for the first time at the age of 79. Because of her role as society's gatekeeper in Southampton, Louisa is sometimes described as the last of the dreadnoughts, but she has little in common with those boring old ladies and their tedious teas. Outspoken, she often shares her strong opinions with society columnists, though it's considered unseemly for a woman of her rank to engage with the press. With advancing age, she has more and more to say, and pundits of the social pages delight in her tart comments and pithy observations. So quotable is she that many of her pointed pronouncements live on in chronicles of Gilded Age society. Among those for whom she reserves her greatest scorn are those with money, but neither taste nor restraint. Nothing offends her more than the ostentatious display of wealth, though she, of course, lives in the most luxurious surroundings. The difference, she would insist, is that hers are tasteful surroundings. Southampton has footmen, she acknowledges at one point, but, she sniffs, we've never had footmen in knee breeches. And though she can be kindly in exercising her power over which candidates will succeed in piercing the tight circle of Southampton society, no one who has nothing more than money and social ambition to commend them will get through the gate. It isn't until 1941 that Louisa is obliged to let the last of her tasteful footmen go. They had to go to war, she explains, then adds, and after it was over, my butler said not to even try to get any more. There are very few of us left, she says, 
repeat, repeating a perennial old guard lament. We've opened the door, as you know, she says. The rest are very dear and sweet, and they are lovely people, but it isn't the same thing at all. The Livingston spend their summers at Old Trees for almost 40 years, a long reign for, the, for Southampton's irrepressible grand dame of the old guard. She survives her husband by nearly 10 years, and when she dies in 1960, at the age of 18, 83, Southampton mourns the loss of her queen. And that is where I conclude. That was great, Mary. That was great. Okay. So, if anybody has any questions, we would be more than happy to answer any that anybody might have. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can go down to the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen and submit questions through there or through the chat function. Um, I will also look on Facebook if anybody has any questions to submit there. Doesn't look like it. Let's see. All right, well, if not anybody has any questions, I, we wanna thank everybody for joining us today for this talk. And we also wanna remind everybody about our, a couple of our programs that are coming up in the future. Um, in fact, this Saturday will be the opening of our thrift shop. Um, we weren't sure if we were gonna be able to open it this year, but actually this Saturday, the 27th, um, from 11 a.m. To, uh, to 5 p.m., the Carriage House Thrift Shop will be open. Um, we will require you to wear masks inside and we'll be limiting the amount of people that can come in, but please feel free to come by during the day. Hopefully it's nice and bright like it is today. And if you need to wait before you come inside, you can walk, walk around the yard and check out our property. Um, but, oh, we have, do have a few questions. Um, first, when did the homes on Gin Lane begin to appear? Um, they, uh, well, Dr. Thomas, uh, was the first, uh, in 1870. It was pretty sparse for a while, uh, but in the 1880s, but then, you know, as, as you went further west, it, it was, those houses came much later. And then we had another person, not a question, but a comment from Kathleen Hendrickson uh, saying, just a thank you, Mary. I greatly enjoy this series. Well, how nice. Thank you. And then <laughs> we have a few more questions. Um, where is her grave? So I see we see a picture of it there, but is that in Southampton anywhere? Yeah, or? that's in Southampton, in the, South, um, in the uh, Southampton Cemetery. That's the main one. The one on, um, there are two side by side. Um, off 39. Yeah. Um, and then is her hum or her summer home still there? Yes. That's is there. So is, I mean, both the one, her childhood summer home is there, the dolphins, and uh, uh, old trees is there. Okay. Um, are the grounds open to the public to walk around? So I imagine that is asking about the museum. And yes, um, our grounds at the museum are open to the public. Feel, you can feel free to come by and walk around whenever you please. Um, another person saying, thank you, Mary, for the presentation. Um, and another person asking, any of her descendants still around in Southampton? Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, in, the, um, in the 90s, I spoke with her son, uh, Goodhue Livingston Jr., who lived in Wainscot. Okay. I, I don't know of any, maybe there, you know, there could be, but I don't know of any. He, he has since died. Gotcha. All right. And then we had a few more people saying thanks and great lecture, great talk. Um, and somebody asking, when will the museum be opening? Um, these talks are so interesting, thank you. So we're not exactly sure when exactly the museum will be officially opening. I believe we're, we're shooting for 
um, July 8th. Um, it will most likely be appointment only. Um, so you'd have to call and make appointments. Once we have an official plan and idea for when we can open, we will make that stuff all available, both on our website and all of our social medias. And if you're on our email list, you'll get an email with all the information. Uh, that way, if you've enjoyed these talks, you can call, make an appointment to come in and be able to see the Gilded Age exhibit in person if you have not had a chance to see it already, um, which we will be thankfully extending through the end of this year. So um, while we're not sure we're, when we're gonna open exactly right now in the short term, we'll definitely be open at some point later this year. So um, originally the exhibit was gonna go down in August, but we will be having it at least through December. So at some point, everybody should be able to get a chance to come by and see uh, the great exhibit that we all worked on really hard. Um, I, I just wanted to say I had any second thoughts about where she's buried. I'm, I realize I never really confirmed that. So um, I'll go to find a grave and make sure where she is, where she okay. <laughs> So maybe in Southampton. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I think it is, but I don't want to give anybody a bum steer. Gotcha. <laughs> well, it looks like um, I don't think there's any more questions. I think just about everybody that was here said thank you or, or sent in a question. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, please make sure to go to our website and read any of our new blog entries, sign up for any of our extra programs. Like I said, the thrift shop is opening this weekend. So please come by and check that out. Um, and our next program that we're going to be doing is Cooking with the Countess. Um, Mrs. Som, who will be showing us all how to make a really great coleslaw. And that'll be next Thursday. Uh, here at 11 a.m. live on Zoom. Uh, she's quite the character. Um, if you've never met her, I think everybody would probably really enjoy that one. So um, until next time, we'll see everybody later. Okay. Bye.